<laughs> so, hey, welcome to week four of our Bible study in the book of Acts. Uh, we, we called the Bible study overall um, the birth of the church. That's the as in the big church. So um, we spent last year doing the, the history of Jesus's ministry using all four Gospels. We did a synopsis walk, so to say, a, 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 a uh, chronological walk through through his ministry, you know, event number one, event number two, and event number three. So the logical conclusion to that Bible study was to move right into the book of Acts because that's what's happening with Acts chapter one is um, you know, it goes into Jesus, but the, the ascension, and then we move right into the birth of the church. So thank you for the church for being here with me this evening. Thank you for those who are watching on the internet. And um, I think that this is going to be a slow or a slow. This will be a slow Bible study. It's a board. No, I think it's going to be a short Bible study. Uh, I say I think because you just never know the way they go. But um, but thank you again for being here. You you allow me to accomplish my calling whenever you come. So let's open up with prayer. We'll do a little bit of review and jump into week chapter four or <laughs> Acts chapter four. Father, we love you and we thank you for all the good things you do for us, Lord. <sighs> Too numerous to count. So Lord, you are uh, guiding us and directing us when we don't even know we need guided, Lord. So your, your goodness and, and mercy is amazing. Sometimes we don't see you moving in our life until it's all said and done. And then we look back and just, wow. So, Father, we thank you for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Uh, we are here together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. We are here to study your word. So I ask that you bless us with your presence. Send the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher and the guide, Father. These, these good folk don't need to hear from me. They need to hear from you. So we ask you that you speak to each and every one of us, speak to our heart, speak to our mind. Allow us to be um, obedient servants unto you, Lord. And, and again, open, open up our hearts to you and you alone. Let us forget about the cares of the world for a little while and concentrate on you. That we do this so we can grow closer to you, so we can know you more. So we ask you that you honor those requests by sending the Holy Spirit. It's all for your honor and your glory. In Jesus name we do pray. Amen. Amen. So again, week four. And I'll, I'll do just a real quick um, catching up. So chapter one is uh, Jesus telling his disciples that, you know, he, he appeared to them. It kind of gives you a little bit of insight. It's trying to push the narrative that there was a lot of people who witnessed Jesus' resurrection. They, they, they witnessed him, over 500 people, including his brothers and sisters and, and all that. They wanted to make sure that we understand that there are eyewitnesses that seen Jesus walk in the face of the earth after they had seen him die on a cross. So there was no... There was no question to both of those events. So week or week two, chapter two is what is known as the day of Pentecost. It, it wasn't the event that makes up Pentecost. It's the event happened on the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost, Pena is 50. So 50 days after Jesus was crucified on the cross, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came down. And that's Acts chapter two. It says that the people heard that. It's a miracle because it said like tongues of fire, the place shaking. And <clears throat> um, the, the place was shaken and, and the people heard and seen this. And they, and they said, don't pay attention to them. They're just drunk. So we, we move on a little bit longer in, in our, in our uh, storyline. I think about two or three years before we get to chapter three and John and Peter are walking into the temple. They healed this crippled man, and it was a uh, very public event. And that's very important that we understand. remember that from last week. It was a public event. They would carry this guy into the temple gate in front of the gate called Beautiful so he could beg alms for people that was going into the temple to pray. So it's what John and Peter happened to be walking by him at the three o'clock prayer. And the guy hollered and asked for alms. And Peter said, we know the words. He said, silver, gold, I don't have any. I have none. But what I have, I will give to you. And he picks him up by the hand and helps him to his feet in front of everybody. So the guy's dancing and hopping around. 
And uh, to much everybody's amazement, we've seen this in chapter three that um, Peter sees his opportunity and he begins to preach. So this is the way I, I brought it last week is that the, the healing of the lame man was the second miracle that we see in the book of Acts. Peter, right? With that one miracle, there was two outcomes. The first one was Peter had seen his opportunity and he preached the gospel and it says the people was, believed him and got saved and baptized. Here comes chapter four. This is the second outcome of this first miracle. So everybody understand what we're doing now. The second outcome, because it's going to start off while, while he was still speaking. So he's still preaching this sermon with people listening. And um, I just found this picture and we're going to leave it here for quite a while. But uh, while Peter was speaking, we see uh, chapter four unfold while he was still speaking. But before we get there, I know I do this stuff. Before we get to chapter four, I want to remind you what happened a few years back. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. The end of the book of Matthew, right? Matthew 26, verse 59. Yeah. Matthew 26, verse 59 says this. Th th this is going back to when Jesus was arrested. Because that's what we're getting ready to talk about is Peter and John getting arrested. I kind of want to show you the similarities in the two and why these are similarities are important. Verse 59, it says, inside the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus. Now, now remember, this is the religious, religious elite. They're not trying to find somebody who disagrees with Jesus. They're trying to find somebody that will lie. Everybody see that? <clears throat> it said so they could put him to death. But even though they tried to find many who would agree to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. So, never, so in other words, their lies wasn't good enough to be believable. Uh, finally, two men come forward who declared, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up. The high priest's name is Caiaphas. It's going to become important today. It says, then the high priest stood up and he said to Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you're the Messiah, the son of God. And Jesus replied, and I, I know I've, I've kind of beat this horse before, but man, this, this reply is so awesome. He says, you have said it. And in the future, you will see the son of man seated in a place of honor at God's right hand, coming on the clouds of heaven. So when he said the Son of Man, he said it in Aramaic. And the reason why that's important is because that's what Daniel wrote chapter 7 in was Aramaic. And that's what he used is he said it was a God figure. It was a deity that he said looked like the Son of Man on the clouds. So Jesus used the Aramaic term. The, the Hebrew term is Bar Adam, the Son of Man. He said, I'm the Bar Nash which is what Daniel said in seven. He was saying, I'm the cloud rider that Daniel spoke about in, in seven. So that's why we see this, this crazy response. Cause he said the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, blasphemy. Why do we need other witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? And they all shouted guilty. They shouted, he deserves to die. I'm still going to read on. Then Jesus, I'm sorry. And then they began to spit in Jesus's face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, uh, jeering, prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you that time? Who's hitting him? The temple guards? No, the priest. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside. 
Now you're starting to see why we're coming to the round to this. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those that was with Jesus, the, the Galilean that Peter denied. He denied it in front of everybody. I don't know what you're talking about. He said later out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it this time with an oath. You know, it's like, I swear. He's saying, I don't even know the man. He said a little later, some of the other bystanders come over and said, and over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. I can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't even know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, you know, the story. It says, suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. He said he went away weeping bitterly. So this is important to understand what what Peter transpired when whenever Jesus went before this high council. The reason why is because we're getting ready to start into Acts chapter four. And guess where Peter's going? Right in front of these same guys. So because it even names we're going to see we're going to see Caiaphas name. So we're going to see the exact same guys. Um before I drag you out there, can I read just a few more verses? Let me see, 27. No, we'll come back to it because I'm, I'm a good ways away. So let's go to Acts chapter 4. If you've got a bookmark, put it in that Matthew because we're going to come back and read again a little bit out of there in, a, in a, just a few moments. Oh, how about this? Everybody back in Acts? So since it's just right there, probably on the same page, look at chapter three, because I, I just wanted to point this out to you, because we just seen where Peter just denied who Jesus was three times. Look in Acts chapter three, verse 12. It said Peter saw his opportunity to address the crowd. <clears throat> this is the same guy. He said, people of Israel, he said, uh, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we have made this man walk on our own power or godliness for it was God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors who has brought glory to his servant, Jesus, by doing this, this same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected uh, before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. So now we see the same guy who denied Jesus three times. Now we see him stand, standing up and boldly saying, this man was healed in, in the name of Jesus. So the before and after, what changed in his life? The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave him that boldness. And we're going to see again where they pray again for boldness. But it gave him that boldness to go from denying him three times to standing up in front of everybody and saying it's Jesus. So here we go. Uh, Acts chapter four. I'm going to read verses one and two. It says, while Peter and John were speaking, and I, and I read a little bit what they were saying, but while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Jesus and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there was a resurrection of the dead. Now, there's a couple reasons why they were so mad about that. One is the, the, the Sadducees, doesn't believe in a resurrection. So how crazy is that to, to, for them to think that Jesus rose from the dead? They don't even believe in that. So that's, that's one of the reasons why. Um, they was the ones that was telling people that the disciples had came in the middle of the night to steal the body so they could lie to the people and say, look, he raised from the dead. Right. So I found this. I'm going to take you right back to Matthew again, and I apologize, but it kind of I'm kind of putting these two stories together. So back to Matthew, this time, 27. Because I, I don't know if you if you ever draw these similarities before. 
Matthew 27, I'm going to start in 68. Or 62, I'm sorry. Matthew 27, 62. I know it's a long chapter, isn't it? So here I go. Matthew 27, starting in verse 62. I'm going to read through the first few verses of chapter 8. So I, 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 this time we're going to pay attention to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those guys. So here we go. It says, the next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. So Jesus has been crucified. Jesus is dead in the crawl in the in the uh, tomb on Saturday, which is the Sabbath. The leading priests and the Pharisees went to to see Pilate. They told him, "Sir, we remember that the deceiver once said, while he was alive, after three days I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing the body and telling everyone he was raised from the dead." If that happens, we'll be worse off than we was in the first. So Pilate replied, take guards. So see who the responsibility is on. It's back on to the, the Pharisees. He says, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. That was the Pharisees did that. It says early on Sunday morning. We know this story. As a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. We, we hear this story every Christ, or Easter morning or resurrection morning. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone. You know, you've heard this, that they didn't roll the, uh, the stone aside to allow Jesus to come out. It was so that the two witnesses could walk in and, and see for themselves that he was already gone, right? Rolled, rolled the stone, rolled aside the stone, sat on it, said his face shined like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw them and they fell into a dead faint. So the guards, they pass out. That's where I was trying to get you to. The guards seen the angel shook with fear, and pass out. So, so just go a few verses ahead. Stay in chapter 28, but go to verse 11. It says, as verse 11, 28, 11, it says, as the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city. So we're paying attention to these guards now. Went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. What did, they, what did the guards tell the leading priest? Well, we just seen an angel come down and roll the stone aside, sit on it, and we passed out. <laughs> so, so here he goes. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided, that, no, the same guys that, that, that we just read about the trial of Jesus, the ones that we're getting ready to read about in Acts chapter 4, it says the meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. Did they believe this story? Do you bribe somebody you don't believe? The soldiers, a large bride, they told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples come during the night while, they, while we were sleeping and stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we will stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they was told to say. Their story spread wide among the Jews and it is still uh, and they still tell it today. So that was today whenever Luke wrote this book. So these guys know better. They, they, they trying to get people to lie to say that Jesus was guilty. They couldn't find a good enough lie. They asked Jesus who he is. I'm the bar and Ash, and you'll see me coming on the clouds. What else do we need? He needs to die. So after they crucify him, after all that happens, the guard comes up and says, man, there's a big angel come down out of the sky and rolled the stone away and Jesus wasn't there. So then, then they bribe him. So you, you got to kind of put this all in context because now they got these two yahoos standing on the temple steps and they just healed some guy in front of God and everybody. And they, so they got a problem. What do we do now? So back to Acts. <laughs> I know, sorry, I'm not going to move you anymore. We're going to stay in Acts. 
And so much for a short Bible study. We did verse 3. We've been at 20 minutes. <laughs> Acts chapter 4, verse 3. And it says, They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until the morning. So yeah, that's pretty easy to understand. But I, I kind of thought of this as these guys are the first ones to be arrested after Jesus's, after his crucifixion. Right. First Christians to be arrested. Verse four. But many of the people who heard their message believed that that was why they were standing on the temple steps. It says many of the people believed it. So the number of the believers were total of about five thousand men, not counting the women and children. So I don't know what the actual number is. We count women and children. Right. So I don't know what the actual number is, but we went from three thousand to five thousand. And I know. We read this stuff. We're only beginning chapter four. If you sit down to read the book of Acts, you can probably be in chapter four in 15 minutes or so, if not sooner. And you think and all this happened within a week. It didn't. We're talking a couple years. So the church grew. I'm going to say, can we say 7,500 maybe just to throw it out there? I don't know. I think it'd be like closer to 10,000. So, okay, so it grew from 3,000 to 10,000 in a couple years. That's pretty darn good growth. I want to go back to, to week one. Remember our, our layout of the five ways of ministry, the, the five keys? If we do our ministry, God will add to the church. So 10,000, I like it. So verse five. Yeah, here we go. Remember who I said was high, high priest? Caiaphas. But, but this tells us something a little different, and I got an explanation. Verse 5 says, The next day the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and, I'm sorry, Alexander and other relatives of the high priest. So what's going on there? Let me, let me say this. Caiaphas is still the, the high priest. The Romans put him in, which we know that that's not how it works in God's eyes, but the Romans put Caiaphas in that position and replaced Annas. But a, the, the position of a high priest is a lifetime position. So when it says, there, there's, no, there's no contradiction when it says the high priest Annas, it's perfectly fine. He just wasn't the sitting high priest. He was the past high priest. Caiaphas replaced him. So in other words, who's our president? Joe Biden. No smart aleck knows. <laughs> Joe Biden. But whenever they introduce Donald Trump, they still say President Donald Trump. He's not the sitting president. He's the past president. So that's the way it is with Annas here. He is the past high priest, but he's still part of this group. Along with Caiaphas, he's still there. These are the same guys that we've been reading about in Matthew. All right, so let me see. Yeah, I, that's how I put it is it's a lifetime position. It was a, it's a respect thing. So verse 7, they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or whose name have you done this? So, so, so remember that name means by power or authority. So they're asking, by what authority did you do this? And, and here we go, verse 8, I'm going to read 8 and 9. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, um, are, you being, are, are we being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? So he, he's, he's getting ready you know, he's getting ready to set him up. Did you bring us in here to ask us how he was healed? Right. So he set him up, asking him a question. And then here comes the boom for them. Verse 10, he says, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man crucified I'm sorry, the man you crucified. This is the third time he said that in the book of Acts. The man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. I can see him all sitting there going, what do we got to do to get rid of this? We, we've done everything in the world. We, we, we beat this guy. We've, 
We made him carry a cross up a hill. We crucified him. We, we put him in a tomb and he's still badgering us. What do we got to do? So they're, they're probably frustrated, mad as much as they was when Jesus said he was the bar and ash. They're probably ready to rip their clothes. So I put there again, and for the third time, Peter has, has said something that would cut straight to the heart. The guy you crucified. Last week in Acts chapter 2, I can't, I've, been, I've been reciting those words in my head for too much. You killed the author of life. Verse 11. I got to find it. See, I'm starting to tear up. Can't read. You know, you can't let a guy named Squint tear up. Here we go. Verse 11. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. So they know who all three people are here. The, the three references. They know that Jesus is the stone. They know that they're the builders that rejected him. And he says that he has become a cornerstone. A cornerstone is the foundation of a building. He's the foundation of the church, the temple. We're the temple, not one individual. Us as a group is the temple of God. So Jesus is the, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation. So they knew exactly what that meant. That was a, a reference to uh, Psalms, Psalms 118, I believe, verse 22. So, so look. This, this verse, I'll say this. Everybody knows what a dogma is. A dogma is a line in the sand. A, a, this is, this is a truth. If you don't believe this, if you don't agree with me, you're wrong and I'm right. That's, that's a very bold, uh, stand to take. And I don't have too many dogmas in saying that if I meet somebody that I don't agree with on, Issues like baptism, um, the rapture. I could go through a whole bunch. Um, communion. You know, some people take it with wine. Some people don't. Some people wear a robe to church. None of that stuff to me matters. This is a dogma. This verse, verse 12, because he says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. Talking about Jesus, there is salvation in no one else. So I, I was talking to my coworker today and he said, what scares me is the Bible verse that says the way to heaven is narrow and, no, and the gate to destruction is wide. I said, don't look at that being narrow as being just a few people and wide being a vast crowd. That's true. But look at narrow is there's only one way to heaven and it's a very narrow road. It's Jesus. There is no second way. There is no being a good person, being a good person important. Well, sure. It don't get you to heaven or, you know, all, all the other stuff that I can name. Um, um, selling every, everything you have and giving your money to the poor. Good thing. Well, yeah, that'll make you a saint in the Catholic church. Does it get you in heaven? No. Sorry. <laughs> So, so the, the road to heaven or to righteousness or however else you want to word that is very narrow. And Peter said it right here. There is salvation in no one else. That's narrow. That's my dogma. And, I, I, and, and again, I, I, to me, it's overly bold and I hate being that bold. But if somebody tells me, me and Roy and there's a, a handful of others, that was standing in line at the spaghetti warehouse in Columbus, Ohio. And a girl behind me said that, I think if I remember the story correctly, and I might not, I might be mixing up a couple stories. I'm good for that. But I think she told me she was Wicca. And she said, it's okay. It's, it's really close to Christianity. You know, I'm going to heaven too. I go, no, you're not. <laughs> and, and, and I heard those words come out of my mouth and I'm like, you, yeah, I normally don't talk like I don't tell somebody, no, you're not going to heaven. You know, so that's not going to get you to heaven. Oh, yeah, we're, we're religious. Good. It ain't going to get you to heaven. Religion don't get you to heaven either. Did it say that? <sighs> Again, that's my dog wrong <laughs> if you don't agree with me. So and I get that from here because it's the only way you, you got to put your foot down somewhere. So, uh, 
going back to like baptism. I don't care. I don't care. I, I do want to see you get baptized. It's a, it's a part of obedient, being obedient to the Lord. He told you, get saved, be baptized, right? It's part of our obedience. It's what we do. It doesn't say you're saved because you are baptized. So you want to get baptized? Fantastic. I'll do it for you. I'll help you. I've baptized people in a hospital bed before. Um, um, in, in little kiddie pools, you name it, there's been water. I probably baptized somebody in something like that. But uh, I'm not going to argue with you on it. It's, it's not worth the argument. Jesus is the only way, not water baptism, not anything. We, uh, that, that's it. So anyhow, moving on. <clears throat> All right. So, so just to read my last sentence I put in that, I put, if you do agree with me on that verse, um, oh, so I put, if you don't agree, I'm sorry. If you don't agree with that, with that dogma, I said, you know, we're not going to be in heaven for you to find out. You know, we're not never going to talk again. So anyhow, moving on. Verse 13. Uh, I like this. It says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. I, I, I've been saving that sentence for you for a while. Because what did he do the first time? Denied. Denied, denied. So now he, they're amazed at his boldness. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. I almost think that's a requirement for God to use you is you got to be ordinary. Because if you're extraordinary, what people are going to say, boy, I can see God on him. You see that change in his life? If you're, if you're extraordinary. So I almost see that being a requirement. Uh, one of my uh, favorite Christian hippies wrote a book called The Ordinary Revolution. Talking about a revolution that starts with ordinary people. So here we go. They also recognized as men who had been with Jesus. So what's that mean? They recognized these two guys. Remember, Peter was Peter went with them. He stayed outside the courtyard. John went through them with the whole thing. He was at the he was at the cross. Remember, remember Jesus looking at him and said, "Son, here's your mother." So. They recognize him. But since, <laughs> I'm sorry. But since they could see the men who had, who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So I, I pointed it out last week whenever we seen the man being healed that it was super important that this miracle been done in, in public, in broad daylight. Why? There's no skirting around at this time. There's no, they're just drunk. Don't pay no attention to them. The guy's standing right there leafing around like a deer, right? So verse 15 said, so they ordered Peter and John out of the chamber and they conferred among themselves. So they, they are going to ask, what are we going to do here? But, but again, how important is it that this miracle was done right in front of the gate called beautiful in front of worshipers, in front of people who are religious, people who are seeking God. They're there to pray. And and now he's healed in front of so many and, and they want to deny this. They would probably bribe or pay somebody to lie about it, but there's nothing that they can do at this point. The, 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 the miracle is, how do you put it, out of control. Verse 16. And it says this. It said, what should we do with these men? They ask each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miracle, a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. Again, why it's so important. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda. I don't know what King James says. I didn't look. NLT says propaganda. Any further, huh? It says, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So prop, I had to look it up. Propaganda means misleading information. So that's what they got. They were saying that, that this name of Jesus is misleading information. We need to stop this. Now, here comes a real brilliant idea. So verse 18, it says, so they called the apostles back in, back in and they commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. 
Well, that worked, right? We ne nobody here has ever heard of Jesus. All right, so uh, so look, I, I just in my bullet notes, I wrote, although the evidence of that healing was irrefutable, the religious leaders, they refused to believe it. When we go back to verse 12, go back to verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must, must be saved. I hate to say this, unless these religious men, these are the religious lead of the day, unless they ended up sometime in their life repenting, they missed it. Their religious status means nothing. That, that way to heaven is very narrow. So verse 19 and 20. It says, but Peter and John replied, and this is like the, the, the ultimate reply. They said, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? So even a, uh, someone who's trying to act like they're religious knows better than that. Verse 20, we cannot stop telling every, telling everything we have seen and heard. So they're not saying we're going to go out and tell everybody about Jesus. They're saying we're going to be witnesses to what we've seen and heard. I hope you heard what I said. Witnesses. Because we're supposed to be witnesses of what we see and hear. So we don't have to make nothing up. You don't have to defend the Bible. The Bible's perfectly capable of defending itself. Same way with God. You don't have to defend God. Our only job is to, is to tell people what we've seen and heard. Your, your salvation story. Because guess what? Nobody can tell your story but you. Peter and John, they was in a unique position where nobody could tell their story but them. So that's why your testimony, your witness is important. Nobody else can tell it. All right. So uh, <laughs> where did I leave off? 21, all the way up there. The council then threatened them further. So, so their plan didn't work. Peter and John said, eh, we, we can't do that. So the council threatened them even further, but finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was. Why would they want to stop that? All right. That's just something that kind of struck me as odd is why would people who think that or uh, they are over leading people to God. They're, they're there to uh, sacrifice for them to get them closer to God. They hear them praising God and they want to stop it. Verse 22, for the miraculous sign, the healing of the man who had been lame for more than 40 years. There we go. With how long he had been laying out that gate. Everybody knew him. A few more verses. This is what I put. The religious elites, they couldn't sweep this miracle under the rug. They wanted to uh, so that no one would have known that, that God had healed this man. They was trying to keep that from, from happening. But, you know, you have to ask yourself, why? Th these people are religious leaders. Why are they trying to keep people from knowing who God is? Verse 23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them that the leading priests and the elders, what they had said, when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices toward or together in prayer to God. So before we read the prayer, and we're going to here in a minute, but why would they have, why would the, 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 the Christians, why would they have prayed at this moment? That would have been a, a celebration moment, wouldn't it? Peter and John got arrested. They told him, don't do that. Oh, we're going to do that anyways. And they let him go. Be going, yeah. Why would they have prayed? I think they were scared at this point. They, they was a little worried. They was concerned uh, uh, about what the religious leaders had told them not to do. Don't do that no more. So they was concerned. So they went to, what was their first response? Does it say they worried, cried? They prayed. Here's their prayer. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago 
by your Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why are the nations so angry? I've asked that question a few times. Why? 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 Why are they so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his Savior. I'm going to keep reading one more verse. In fact, this has happened. So uh, this is end time stuff about the the rulers of the earth coming against the Lord and his Messiah, but they're tying it into this is happening right now, too. That's what he says. In fact, this has happened here in our very city for Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. They're, they're getting the feeling that it's them against the world at this point. The entire world's coming against me. So they're making a connection with the kings of the earth coming against them and all those that oppose the name of Jesus, right? Verse 28. Told you this is going to be a shorter Bible study. Verse 28. But everything they did was determined beforehand. Whew, man, that gets difficult. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. Uh, so I'm going to stop there because uh, for a moment. Kind of gets into predestination, doesn't it? Everything was already determined. These people made no decisions. They had no choices in it. So I know I've, I've done this once or twice before, but, but here's how it is. Predestination is a Christian theology that bling, that believes that everything happens because God makes it happen. Whatever you had for dinner today was because God had predestined your dinner. He's, he predestines everything. In other words, he's a micromanager. He has his finger on everything. Other theology, it's called free will. And that, that theology believes that you have the ability to choose over right over wrong. So that's, that's the two. And, and, and they kind of argue with each other and that might not be proper name someone say well i'm not either one i'm this or whatever but but anyways that's it roughly you believe that that god is in control of everything the weather he does everything or there's free will god put everything in motion and he wants you to do what's right but ultimately you have the choice so i know where some of you believe because some of you come out of the free will baptist and that's what that means Free will. They believed it because the, the Baptist was having this discussion. No, we don't have a choice over right or wrong. God's in control. He makes the decisions for us. Then the other half was like, no, <laughs> I have a free will. I choose if I do right or wrong. So that's, that's free will Baptist. I, I absolutely lean towards free will. I, I believe myself, and I'm talking about myself, that God is sovereign, which means he has authority over everything. But he also has given us free will. That's part of his sovereignty. So he knows ahead of time. Where's Terry? Terry's here. Good. Everybody knows that she's my, my, my punching bag. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I just picked you out one day and it stuck. So he knows that Terry's going to make, or, or God's going to, this event's going to happen, whatever it is. And Terry is going to, to react this way. So he will use that reaction before it ever happens for his will to do what he wants it to do. Just because he knows how she's going to react doesn't mean that he's making her do it. Does that make sense? I almost think of it like I go to the doctor and he takes that hammer a little rubber hammer and hits my knee. He knows what's going to happen, but he didn't make my knee jump. He hit it and he knew it was going to. So God is like the doctor. He knows how, how we are going to react. And he, he uses those reactions before they ever happen to make his will come about. Does that make sense? That's kind of difficult to explain, 
Maybe I should just read it the way I have it wrote. Maybe I did it better then. But God is in control. God knows how each of us are going to react to every, every decision. So he uses every person, every event. I do like it better. Every person, every event, every action, and every reaction to carry out his outcome. No one or nothing is above his sovereignty. I do believe that. But he's not micromanaging. He put our ecosystem in and he doesn't say today it's going to rain, tomorrow it isn't. Sorry, farmers, I know you can all pray for rain, but, but I think he put it in motion and it does what it does. So anyways, moving on. There's just a few more verses. Verse 29. Uh, here we go. And now, O Lord, hear the threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. So I love, love, love their response because did they ask, Lord, hear their, revenge, their, their threats and save us. Lord, hear their threats and take us out of this city and take us someplace safe. No, they said, hear their threats and give us boldness to stand up against them. So they didn't pray for him to remove the threat. They prayed him that even in the, in the face of a threat, that they would continue to be bold. Verse 30. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So, um, again, the miracles was to prove that Jesus was indeed who he said he was, who they was claiming that, that Jesus was and who they was saying that they witnessed Jesus was. So our last verse, it said, after this prayer, has anybody ever missed this verse? After this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then, then they preached the word of God with boldness. So a few things that sticks out to me. It says the place shook. It doesn't say that Jerusalem shook or the country shook or the Middle East shook. It was that place, wherever they was at, shook. And it says that they was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the, I kind of got into this empowering, empowerment and indwelling. Everybody remember that kind of might seem odd to you where I was going with it because it's going to be kind of a, a thing throughout the whole book of Acts. This wasn't the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These were people who was already filled with the Holy Spirit. This was an empowerment come upon them because they prayed for it. Give us boldness to speak even in the face of danger. And what's the last, what's that, that last sentence says? And they preached the word of God with boldness. So they, they received empowerment to do that. The place shook and they received the power. So after, after, you think after you say amen and the place begins to shake, what would you think? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's what had happened. It says not an earthquake, just where they was at. And that's, that's the way I read it. That's the way it was worded. But that feeling is the empowerment and that feeling was accompanied. It was, it wasn't accompanied by, by other tongues or, or other languages or any other sign. What did they receive? Boldness. So I am going to stop there because uh, the next verse, verse 32, starts a whole nother subject of sharing. So I don't, I don't want to, I want to stay with, um, John and Peter with, with Caiaphas and the same people who, who lied about Jesus, who, who paid off Judas to, to, to betray Jesus, who got the report from the guards that they seen the angel. All these guys, they're still denying it. Deny, deny, deny. So I guess it's almost like a salvation moment. How many of you have ever been guilty of denying, denying, denying? So I remember when, when God was dealing with me. I smoked cigarettes back then. I, I didn't quit till after I got saved. But I remember during altar calls, I would go outside and smoke cigarettes on the street. Boy, I made it through that one. Whew. That, that's how I was denying it. I was trying to stay away from it. Um, a good friend of mine, 
Alan, uh, he did the same thing, and he literally would sweat through altar calls. And it, and it wasn't till he had a car wreck and killed his friend that he got saved. It took that. So hope it does, I hope if anybody's watching, don't know the Lord, I hope it doesn't take something that drastic. But you're, there's only one way, and you're denying that one way. So thank you for being here. Uh, next week, we'll jump on on the, the believers sharing and the ones who doesn't quite share so well and, and all that good stuff. You know, Acts chapter five. But um, yeah, hope, hope you stayed awake. I didn't see anybody nodding off. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we go. Me too. So thank you all for being here until next week. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time you've given us together as believers. Your word is amazing. The, the uh, example that our, our forefathers and four sisters gave us in uh, the Christendom world and how they started and their boldness, their prayer, the shaking, all the, all the, all the stuff that they had to endure. It's inspiring. It's encouraging. It's, it's spurring us. So, Father, we thank you for your word. It is glorious. It's marvelous. It is perfect. And I uh, thank you for our brothers and sisters who come out. Lord, I pray that you bless them. Help us to keep the kingdom of God first in our life because it says if we keep the kingdom of God first, you'll take care of all the stuff that, that the normal people have to uh, worry about. So we love you. And until we come together next week, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.